high-level policy advisory and leadership capacities, including as director and senior policy advisor at the African Policy Institute. He is the founder and CEO of Actualize Center, a distinguished herb for personal growth and professional development training. And if you've not subscribed to that podcast, you definitely need to. Uh, he'll tell us more about that. Dr. Casper has a robust research portfolio has published in academic journals and contributed to policy reports and has spoken at numerous conferences including this one and live media seminars hallelujah let's put our hands together and in invite dr casper to join and he'll invite his speakers amen amen let's give it up for our organizers let's give it up for our organizers Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. I love that session. Don't laugh at people's trauma. Don't laugh at people's trauma. You know, generationally, we were taught, be strong. Don't cry. Men don't cry. All right. And you can see that we say men are not emotional. No, we are, we are complex emotionally. And uh, because we think we are not emotional, we, we begin to control and manipulate. We don't realize it's there. So thank you for that teaching. Today I was, you know, I was asked to do a session on leadership, generational leadership, and I wanted to be intentional. So here I have Gen, Gen Y and Z. I've been told these are called high tops. So we want to represent everybody, okay? Gen Y and Z. Here I have young millennials with my jeans. Older millennials, I got you this shirt. Here are the Gen X, the 70s babies. If you're older than 70s, I can only give you my beard. So you may have your seat uh, today. And so welcome to our session. And I want to call our panelists. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And welcome everybody. Pastor Chumaini and the rest. I love it. I love it. There's so many young ministers from the DFW area. Uh, and by young, really, they're already... Middle, actually, it's inter intermediate. So, um, first, I want to. Uh, uh, I'm here with my minister uh, and with the teams. I just want to wave at them. Uh, Apostle Mwanga, Pastor Becky, Pastor uh, Jesse, Pastor Max. I, I honor you, right? It's good to honor the guys that you're with. We minister at International Harvest Church. Of course, I was here, Pastor Maora. Mom, I don't know where she is, Miss Bishop, uh, Pastor Kak, and the rest of you. I honor you, Davy. We were, you know, he was my senior when I was helping with the youth ministry, right? And so I honor all of you. Uh, first, I want to call Apostle Juma. Apostle Juma, let's give it up a, a good hand for Apostle Juma as he comes and take his, takes his seat. Even as he's coming up, Apostle Juma is the team leader of the Alliance of Apostolic Churches and Ministries, a relational network and umbrella organization representing senior ministers and apostolic churches across Kenya. He is the founder of Elevate Television and serves on the Executive Council of the Kenya Council of Church Alliances and Ministries, an oversight body for evangelical, Pentecostal, charismatic, and apostolic churches in Kenya. Apostle Juma is also the national convener of the Kenya's International Coalition of Apostolic Leaders. Through his apostolic ministry, he travels extensively bringing his message to Africa, Europe, the Americas, Asia, Australia, and the Middle East. Let's give it up again for Apostle Juma for his presence. I guess I'll sit down. All right, next I'll Call Pastor Asunta Juma. Let's also give it up for Pastor Asunta Juma as she comes and takes her position on stage. Pastor Asunta Juma is a dedicated prophetic minister with over 20 years of experience ministering at local and international conferences. She is the founder of Sisters Keeper Africa Trust, an organization focused on women's education, mentorship, and economic empowerment. Additionally, she hosts the annual Women of Power Conference in Nairobi, bringing together women of faith to inspire, uplift, and uplift each other. Pastor Sunta also serves as a trainer at the Gospel Light College, a part-time apostolic Bible school, and is the author of the book God's Girls. 
Unleashing the Power of Spiritual Motherhood, published by Radical Resources, where she is a co-director. Co she holds a bachelor in education uh, from the University of Nairobi and a master's in Christian education from Nairobi Graduate School of Theology. Welcome again, Pastor Asunta Juma. Finally, we have Pastor T. Mwangi. If Pastor T. Mwangi can please come to the stage. Yes. He serves as the senior pastor of Life Church International Limuru in Kiambu County, Kenya, and leads the Gathering of Champions, an interdenominational fellowship in Nairobi. Additionally, he is the president of the Truth Mentorship Society, which mentors over 100,000 youth annually, both in and out of school. Known for his dynamic approach to leadership development, he is a sought-after corporate trainer and conference speaker collaborating with institutes such as the Beth, Bethel Internet Network and the SHIFT program. As a Kingdom business trainer, he partners with Business Incubation Africa and other organizations to equip entrepreneurs with biblical grounded business principles. With a heart for mentorship, he is a spiritual father, a guide to young people worldwide operating under an apostolic grace. Let's give it up for Pastor T. Mwangi. All right, this is a session I've been looking forward to. I hope some of you are looking forward to. We are looking into leadership. And when you're around apostles, your core work is to set things and to found things. So I would like to welcome you. Again, my name is Dr. Casper. Um, because of time, I'll get directly into my questions uh, with my panelists. So I'll start with you, Apostle Juma. I want you to start us off by defining. I like to define things before I get into a topic. So I'd like to def you to define for us what is faith-based leadership and is there a difference between faith-based leadership and just leadership in your wow. view? Thank you so much, Casper. I don't know whether we'll be able to have scriptures. On, I yeah. think our team can put scriptures, yes. Yeah, if we can. Psalms 107. Verse 7 to me defines spiritual leadership. Now, Psalms 107, uh, before it shows up, wherever it's coming from, mm -hmm. it says of God, and he led them forth in the right way, that they may go to a city for a dwelling. This is God. Providing leadership. Just verse 7. So he led them forth. I like the word forth. Because it shows direction. Passion. He's fully motivated. He's focused to lead them. And then he's leading them well. In the right way. So God knows the way. So a leader is somebody who is ready. To move forth. On your marks. Get set. Because he's focused. Has a passion. Motivated. He knows the right way because a leader must know the principles the foundations and know the way lest you lead people because we talk about faith and leadership that they might go to a city people may or may not go so the leader's role is to ensure that he equips he disciples he motivates he encourages he builds there are almost 20 things he needs to do so that they agree to follow him Go with him to a city. To a city. The mic is keeping on getting lost. To a city. That means the leader has a purpose, a goal. He knows the vision. He knows where he's going. When he gets there, the city, then they can dwell there. That means he has arrived. This is spiritual leadership. Mm -hmm. To me, this is one of the greatest verses that defines leadership. There's a relative of this verse, mm -hmm. which is Psalms 136 verse uh, 16 and 17 if we can just mention it and then uh, I think I will not take so much time in the definition Psalms 136 the Bible says in verse uh, 16 Mtoto uh, pastor can help us get that verse the pastor's kid to him who led his people through where? The wilderness. if you can lead people through the wilderness what a leader if you can lead a church through COVID, what a 
leader who can lead people through a difficult, difficult time called the wilderness. This is spiritual leadership. Amazing, amazing, amazing. Let me also, let me build on that because you said something and uh, Pastor Sunto, you can build on that, which is foundation is God, but you also need purpose. So can you define for us, now that we understand faith-based leadership, purpose, faith-based purpose leadership? I think being the church, the people of the kingdom, I think that all we do must be faith-based. And if it is faith-based, then we got to find purpose in our pursuit to lead people um, spiritually. So purpose, I think, must um, be pecked on divine purpose. People have to understand their divine purpose, their God purpose in, in their leadership, in what they are doing. And um, therefore, finding purpose individually and corporately so if I'm a person, I'll be thinking about what is God's mind, what is God's dream for my life? And if I'm leading people corporately, I'll be thinking what is God's mind, what is God's dream for the people that I lead? And then out of that, then I'll, I'll be able to find purpose. And as he has said, it is they were looking for, they were going to a place. I think the place we are going also entails purpose, the purpose uh, um, the place we are going speaks into the purpose of what we are doing in leadership. So I think for me, uh, talking purpose uh, in spiritual leadership, I think that purpose must come from God himself. It must be defined by the God dream and the God idea. Oh, excellent, excellent. And I think also passing this question uh, next part because we've been building. Uh, from defining leadership uh, to talking about purpose as the general, uh, if you can talk about the general understanding that God has given you. And now there's the steps. There's the vision and the mission goals. And maybe Pastor T, um, and by the way, it's good to see, uh, you, uh, you know, this is man, uh, just for reference. First up, you didn't see me, but I saw you. Back in the days when I was in Eastlands, uh, and uh, we were told, uh, we were in Buru, a place called Buruburu, we were told, hey, Mr. T then is uh, going to do some uh, evangelism. But anyway, it's good to see you uh, with how God has used you these many years. So how have you built off the idea of purpose and created vision goals and mission goals for your teams or for your life, um, even as we define this topic? Uh, thank you. One thing I'll say is that, building on what Mama said, um, Dr. Miles Monroe put it very well. Purpose is the virgin original intention that God had while designing a thing. That means when you tap into God, you get the virgin and the original intention that he had concerning something. And then the same tapping now begins to give you the building pattern and the building print of whatever God has called you to do. The mystery of any faith-based vision is as dynamic as the grace availed to implement on it. So that's why when you receive, when you know this, the purpose, and there is clarity of definition of vision, which automatically will birth the mission. Ideally, when the two of them are very clear, uh, in the book of Corinthians, I believe Paul says that every trumpet produces a specific sound. And the sound determines who gathers and who responds. There are, there are trumpets that gather warriors, intercessors. There are trumpets that gather kings. There are trumpets that gather the congregation. And vision, when you begin to announce it, it begins to attract the audience. So naturally, when you, when you know this is the God-given mandate, this is the, the assignment, and this is the building pattern, the Moses dimension. When you begin to announce it, those that are meant to be a part of that vision will come and then the clarity of the mission is what gives the objective is what gives um, the fulfillment the reason is everyone is called to do something unique 
and the culture of humanity is to compare party A with party B. So when you understand that this is the assignment God has given me, and you are clear on the assignment, it will define your audience and it will also delete some people who might become a liability in the work of the assignment. We need to know we are not called for everybody, but the few people we've been called to impact and minister to, the clarity of vision and mission is what will make them be with us, go with us, and follow us. And they become also assets when it comes to building block. Moses gets the pattern, but there is Bazalel who has the skills. So when the vision is announced and the mission is clear, then these particular people come on board. Amazing, amazing. I mean, let's give it up for our panel. And, and you know, the reason why I started where I started is because the audience I'm looking at primarily, if it was in a different setting like academics, this would be the university presidents and the chancellors. If you were in a company setting, these would be the CEOs and the COOs. And from a faith defining, these are the pastors. And so, talking about leadership in a room of leaders is really important to get some of these definitions and to really, uh, if I'm going to say, try today I'm going to milk, maximize uh, the people on stage because they, are, they find themselves in very high levels of leadership. And so, we're going to glean from you today, as if that's okay. And so, this is a multi-generational leadership discussion. And so going back to you, Apostle Juma, how do you steward a multi-generational, multicultural team? And if you think about it this way, and just to put, give you an American context, a lot of our churches may be majority sub-Saharan, right? Majority Kenyan, sub-Saharan. But even when you come to the churches, I, I normally say they are Kenyan Americans and American Kenyans. You can have two 30-year-olds. One was raised in America their whole life. Culturally, they are American. They are American Kenyan. But the same team, you have a 30-year-old who is half lived in Kenya. You know, so you have cultural differences in approach, and then you have generational differences, right? You, you have different age groups. This is a very complex situation. How old do you approach or how do you approach it? I can, I can, uh, want to. Um, thank you, Casper. Um, I'm sure it's like you're doing a thesis. That's why you're asking such a complicated matter. But I will explain this when I appreciate what the rest of the team has said, particularly on the matter of leadership and the implementation of that purpose and everything. A little practical example. God spoke to me. In the bio you read, you missed out that I'm the leader of Life Church International, which is a main church uh, that has birthed a couple of ministries. So being a founder, like your father, the bishop, whom I know for many years, write the vision down, then others will see it. Habakkuk, the guy was cooking in Habakkuk, and they will run with it. So from that vision that we laid down 25 years ago, then it required that we not only evangelize, but also disciple people. Discipling is beginning to lay the biblical foundations for faith. And then from that level, we got to go to the next level we call equipping, breaking down the word of God so it can become tools that believers and God's people can use. And then after we've equipped them and there are measures to check how people are doing, then we can commission them to their ministerial functions. Not to commission them to my ministry, but to their ministerial functions. So with that progression, therefore, it was necessary and it's found it necessary to come up with specific programs, trainings, messages, and someone's that are targeted, targeted to activate, thank you, activate the next generation and all these people hearing. Because when people gather in hundreds, they are coming as a crowd. But out of that crowd, as they hearing the word of God, going through discipleship, equipping, before we can commission them, we are activating them. And then all of a sudden we begin to see certain people that have leanings 
in areas marketplace. These have skills, education, they have experience, they are in business, for instance, or they are in governance. These are likely to become leaders of leaders or go into politics. These are arsonists. These are Holy Ghost, fire, blood, people with gifts of the spirit, gift of healing, prophecy. So the church, therefore, attracts all these various kinds of people. And it is our role as leaders, therefore, to establish a few what I call apostolic foundations. And the foundation is this. Ensure that believers have a relationship with Christ, who is the head of the church, and relationships with one another, and thirdly, relationship with the leader. Because out of years of ministry, Jesus asked them, who do men say I am, and who do you, you yourself say I am? Meaning, if you know who I am as Christ, when I go to the cross, and I'm under test and trial, you will not forsake me. You will still stick with the vision. So what has happened over the years in the ministry we'll be doing, I have seen the rise of all manner of ministers whom we've equipped. So we have seminars, for instance, for the young people. The other day when Gen Z's did their thing, and the Kenyans understand what is the thing they did, I spoke to them in church, gathered them in an afternoon, and I said, I know you're disappointed with everything, including bishops who are disappointed with me. They saw my picture somewhere, meeting some big leaders. They circled my picture. They said, let's greet this one. Uh, they, up to now, I'm still waiting for the greeting. They the forgot. Greeting. Yeah. So uh, what happened is these Gen Zs, we began giving them civic education, telling them the things you are clamoring for are correct. But there's a pattern and a way in which you can pursue these things. And so we have created a cohort to mentor them because there's a specific need. And because I don't have to know everything, I've looped in people who are very good in areas of leadership and tapped into people like Pastor Gigi, a PhD guy seated here, who's been coming to them. And one time he was teaching them, after the noise on the streets, you need to go back and start a business. Otherwise, you'll still be broke. And this is how you start a business. One, two, three, four. And all these guys who are with red eyes in our meetings, their eyes calmed down and the tears left. Now, we're actually going to create an institute for them. Come on, let's give it up. That's okay. Those are just examples. But the relationships must be in place. What does that mean? Do you trust your leader? And the call is, please, and this is a word for everybody, trust those whom God has trusted. If God has trusted the pastor and given him the leadership in the church, you may have problems with him or her, but if God has trusted them and given them ministry, trust them. Who are you? Get healed, like our sister was teaching. Get healed so that you can trust. So our relationships are in place as a foundation because Christianity is more relational than organizational. And coming from a platform of relationships, as a leader, therefore, we can be able to move forward and implement a vision. Last example. You see, my wife is a very gifted woman of God. I can be intimidated by her, her gifts, her messages, her ministry, and so forth. But because of these foundations that have been laid over the years, I'm happy when she succeeds. And so she's one of the most permitted women in Kenya to preach because most women who preach in Kenya have to be single, widowed, or divorced alone for them to succeed. Now we have married women succeeding. How? Because the leader has a big heart like Noah's Ark to allow the next generation. You're never intimidated. Then God brought this man as a rapper. After a couple of years, he has amazing gifts. I'm not intimidated by his fame, power, grace. I want him even to raise the dead. I will preach, I'll give him the mic to raise the dead. And then all of us will have raised the dead. This is how leadership must be. And we have a crisis in the body of Christ. Anytime you see an anointed man, anointed woman, anointed young man, or a person manifesting another type of gift, you feel that, oh Lord, he's going to take over from me. Actually, he should take over. So we need to shift how we are equipping others, how we are 
securely walking with others. How we are creating avenues where them also, they can become. And so what we found over the years as I finish is that the kind and type of meetings we do in the apostolic house and our related ministries are all kinds of meetings from children to their grandfathers because everybody must take their position. And so my work is to network as many leaders from anywhere in the world as possible because I don't have everything. What she can do, I can't do. What I can do, probably she can try. And what he can do and so forth. So we allow everybody, you equip those, you work with this, you equip this. In our little local congregation, we have 73 leaders, elders and deacons and associate ministers. And everybody who is in the leadership, their spouse is an automatic leader with a spouse. Amazing, 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 amazing. And by the way, we also have some cards we're going to pass around, or if they've not really been passed around, you can write some questions as we continue. If there's a question that is burning in you, you can uh, write your questions. Uh, Dr. E will pick up those cards and she will funnel them, some of them, to me, and I'll be using those cards also. So also chime in as a leader, write some questions for us, even as we continue. And I, I like what you've said. Um, I have two questions, uh, Pastor Asunta. Which would be women in leadership? How do we foster women in leadership in churches? Um, especially because we are a mix of what some people can call traditional and modern, uh, kind of coming together. And you have sometimes those questions, how do we foster healthy? And then number two, something that was mentioned, how do you, as a leader, grow to, to make sure that the trauma of the past does not affect your future decisions? For example, maybe betrayals, and now I cannot trust. Uh, maybe disrespect, whatever the issue is, I therefore suppress uh, and control. And so how do you, those are two questions uh, that I want to pass to you. I know they're heavy, but uh, I know you can handle them. Wow, yeah, those are heavy. Um, how do you grow um, women to be leaders? Did I get correct? Yes, um, in a church, in a ministry setting. I think I like what he has said, and uh, for me that is so key. Um, many times when we think the African traditional society, we, only th we, th we always think that everything there is dark and gloomy and lost. But um, I think the African traditional society, in a way, um, gives us sometimes, um, sometimes it defeats us as Christians. I think sometimes they have more to offer to us than Christians. Because the picture of us as Africans, we were community. We were community. And the fathers, and their role, the mothers and their role, and everybody else, and the whole society came along. And I see that that philosophy, if you will, is that idea is what the, new, the, the church, the Bible, is really steeped in community. And um, think about what my husband has said, that I can preach anywhere in the world through. Because we are in community, we are in fellowship, we are in a relationship. So I think understanding the, the, the communal, relational aspect of the church will um, provide a basis to allow not only women, but to allow everybody to come forth and spring forth and find their place in the kingdom and pursue ministry. I'm thinking about the scriptures talking about women saying, let the older women teach the younger women. That's in community again. So I think we got to just start to see church. We got to start to see church as a fellowship, as a community of believers where every person needs to function. So how do we develop them? We become role models. We become mothers. 2006, I wrote a book. I think I was, it was very strange to me. Sometimes I look at it and I wonder, 
where did that come from? But I believe it came from the Holy Spirit. Um, the, 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 the book is entitled, God's Girls on Assignment, Unleashing the Power of Spiritual Motherhood. Uh -huh. So mothers, being mothers, women, pastor's wives, women leaders, ceasing to see themselves on a pedestal, ceasing to see themselves as this, you know, um, um, uh, holding their claims of the positions that they hold, but coming to the beautiful level of being a mother, a spiritual mother. And many women who come to you not as a, as a formidable woman of God, and as a formidable pastor's wife, and that and that, but as a mother in the Lord. And when you see a mother, a mother births, a mother brings forth. And so women can be birthed greatly. And I've seen that happen in our ministry. Uh, many of, I have many people, I can, I can sit down um, on those chairs and have a woman sit here, and they will be able to answer the questions. They will engage you. Yes, and they will engage you well. Why? Because they have been mothered, and I'm not trying to take accolades. It's just the grace of God. But Lois and Eunice and um, Timothy, okay, Timothy is not, is not a woman, but it is the same principle. It's the same principle. So that, that is okay. And the other part is, I think in the church, the men again, the, the, our, our brothers, our leaders, our fathers, again, have to start to realize that women have a place uh, and um, that they need to be brought forth. We need not to use women in church. You know, we need to, to, to uh, not use them, but prepare them so that they can become. We need to nurture them. We need to heal them. We need to see them not as troublemakers, you know especially single women, single mothers. The other day, after a long time, um, and um, I did apologize to my ladies after many years of many, having many single women in our church, single mothers, not just single women, single mothers. And they came to me one time, they asked, but the church looks at us as trouble, you know. And I was very affected by that, and I noticed then I've got to raise my bar to be able to also of a shadow these ones and uh, brood over them and mother them. Today they are leading worship services in our church. Amen. Those single mothers and so forth and so forth. So I'm trying to say that if we understand community, just simple fellowship, and the, the church sees it being organizational, and we become community, what a beautiful peace of, you know, existence of, you, I mean, expression of human relationships. And from there, not only women, even men, young and old, will be able to come through. The second question was, um, how do you, I think that question is mine. How do you, repeat how it do you, again. How do you heal uh, trauma? Yeah. How do you, or not heal, but how do you, mm. how do you, how do, yeah, how do you heal? Mm -hmm. How do you address mm -hmm. with situations or those traumas that you come to discover or realize are affecting the type of leadership that is coming out? The type of leadership that is coming out from women or generally? Just generally. Generally. I think I sat in as, I came in when she was talking and I, I picked a few things that she said and I think, okay, I'm sorry, I didn't get the name. I'll get the name after this. Priscilla. P Priscilla. But I think she said some very formidable things. She said very wonderful things, and I'm sure she said other things before we came in. But I think your question basically is already trying to tell everybody is that there is a lot of trauma to deal with. I think that's exactly what you're saying. Because when people in church, um, the other day I had a lady come and tell me that I really wanted to be married by a pastor. And uh, I asked her, why did you want to get married by a pastor? And she started describing for me the picture of a woman who is married by a pastor. And uh, she had these accolades and this, you know, these huge things that she was looking forward to if she is married by a pastor. And uh, I looked at her and uh, I loved her. <laughs> and uh, I didn't pity her, 
but I wished she was a little, I, I, thought, I thought that's a little bit too simplistic and uh, you don't know what you are signing up to. Yes, so it's too much trauma, too much trouble. No, am I alone here? And it, it doesn't have to be trauma out of ministry. You know what I mean? Yeah, it, it doesn't have to be trauma out of ministry. And ministry can be traumatizing. That's true. Ministry can be extreme. There are bobs you hit when you come into ministry, especially a woman. They are, you know, in, in Africa, we usually say that uh, the, the churches usually say, oh, our wonderful pastor. Oh, a wonderful bishop and apostle. Mm, but that terrible woman who is married. <laughs> who is married? But our pastor is so good. Our bishop is so good. I'm a man of God. But he married that devil. Where did he get that? Where did he get that wife from? Already, already a woman dealing with that. That's quite some bubs. To hit and it's traumatizing. And I think our sister handled the situation very well. I will say this, that um, Paul, when he writes his letters, he usually starts them like this. Grace. Sometimes he had mercy and usually he always have, you know, he says grace, peace. Remind me. Yes, grace and peace. Grace and peace. And then he hands mercy. He is, I usually refer to him many times. Grace and mercy and peace from, our, from, from, the, from the Father, from God, and from the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. I mean from God and from Christ. Be unto you. That's how we survive. That's how we get healed. And I think I heard her talk about the grace space or something. I didn't, I'll read it. Something about grace for, for healing. And grace is divine, divine influence upon a soul. Grace is the work of God upon a soul. And I think um, if we can find, that, I like what she said, that divine encounters with God bring healing for trauma and we need to be able to know that it's trauma there are traumas that we got to deal with we got to bring people who can minister healing like you have done here and we've got to also be able to create again relationships develop relationships where people can be free free spaces nice beautiful spaces healing spaces for people in marriages in families in fellowships for people to grow and come out of their trauma and therefore be strong and proceed forth into ministry. Wow, amen, amen. Let's give a hand for that one. That, that was beautiful. That was beautiful. You know, I, and I'll build even on the last point, you know, getting the right people around you. You know, I normally say, do not waste your efficiency where others have greater proficiency. You know, the, a lot of us want to be everything. We want to we, 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 we wanna be our own counselors. When we have our own trauma, <laughs> we have not dealt with our issues. And so I'll pass this to you, uh, Pastor T. How, uh, how do you bridge the gap and, of course, get people who have efficiency? How do you bridge the gap? Um, I teach, and my first class was 2011 as a teaching assistant. My first co college lecture was given to lecture. So every five years, I have a completely new set of people. Right now, the students who are sitting in the university don't even remember Obama's first term. Right? I'm sure some of them are not even born. Uh, and so you, 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 so you are in the space. You're seeing older millennials who are taking the space, young millennials. How do we empower and lift this top talent and still keep the Gen Ys and Zs and keep bringing them into church? That's a gift that you have demonstrated. And so maybe you can bless us with your leadership tactics, strategies, and understandings on this matter. Well, thank you very much. Um, one of the things is that um, 
they are like in Kenya we have seven generations in existence in one space and um, I remember one day I sat down with a father and he said we are not giving you the mantles when we commission you you know you have our blessing so what he was saying we are still alive and kicking and the ecosystem is the same but I've come to realize that a man can be popular in two generations but he can only affect one generation that's a standard law of impact and that's why you're saying there are people in your class who don't even know the existence of obama and there are those who know obama but obama cannot influence them though he's popular in their day there are those who are impacting their day so the thing is to understand that ministry is generational and the second thing, I believe I capture it in the book of Second Samuel. In First Samuel, David kills one giant, but he comes with five stones. Only to realize in Second Samuel that that giant had sons and a brother. And in the Second Samuel, he's trying to fight the giants of another generation. And the Bible says that giant almost killed him, were it not the intervention of a person in that generation. And this is what they said. Don't go to battle again, but you are the light of Israel. Illumination. You have the strategy, you have the pattern, but you don't have the energy. So we need to understand that whatever a generation is doing is not new. And there are those who have the pattern and the blueprint. So we have to begin to work on a synergy so that this generation deposits in this generation. And this generation with the dynamic of their generation still proclaim and relay the gospel without, uh, you know, compromising it, but still receiving mentorship from the previous generation. Jesus comes and says, go and untie the donkeys in Matthew. He says the young and the older. And then he comes and says, because the master is in need of them both. And the scriptures say, and he rode on them both. How he rode, I don't know. Grammar may fail, but... I think Matthew will explain to me in heaven because he was there. But the bigger picture is God again is not interested in lifting a generation at the expense of another. When it comes to the moves of God, it's always a collision of generations. So there must be a breaching because what is happening is, as Apostle Juma has said, um, sometimes, and this one I'm saying with a lot of love, those who changed our diapers may not believe we can sit on thrones because they are so much preoccupied with our mess and preoccupied with our inabilities in growth. Uh, and so when we mature, they still have the image of a child in diapers. And sometimes, even when you share a vision, it looks like this cannot happen. But the question has always been, who are you raising? Uh. So, so there is a contention. And, and, you, and we've had fathers say, you don't understand what it means to be here. But also, on the other side, I will say, um, there was a famous advertisement that used to be in Kenya, where a son will wake up and the mother will ask the son, Utao Alini. Meaning that there are also fathers who have a problem because their sons have overstayed, though they have matured. And we have confused mentorship and inheritance for literally waiting for the man to die and take over. But what we inherit in the spirit are graces, abilities, and potential for us to advance the work. So there are many of us who have overstayed in the house when the fathers are literally tired and they are asking, Utahulewa, Utahamalini, you know, you've overstayed. We can already sense your work ought to have begun. And some of these are the sons bringing conflict to the fathers because for them, they want the father to exit so that they can take over. But the father is saying, I've invested enough. What you are looking for is not a takeover, is an advancing of this work. Uh, and, and, and that's where you begin to hear we want the mantles and all that. When he blessed me, I knew I need to advance the work because as I advance his territory, I'm already, I'm already inheriting because the grace in him is on me to advance the very nature and the very work. Uh, the other problem that I've observed is in a relay, in a relay, the buttons are not handed in the race. There is a lot of practice before the race. Now, there are strangers showing up in a relay 
And when the fathers are looking back, they're like, I don't know you. We've never prayed together. We've never served together. We've never labored together. But here you are stretching your hand, ready to receive the baton. But a relay is an understanding that everyone has their race to run, but it doesn't mean they were not practicing together. So we have a generation that doesn't show up for equipping, they don't show up for Bible study, they don't show up for prayer, but they show up for impartation. They want the handkerchief, they want the Bible, they want the oil, and by the time you look at them, you're like, no, you are strangers. We didn't, we, you can't run ahead because I don't even know what you are going to advance because legacy has to be carried forward. And that's why now you're seeing some fathers are a little bit cautious because when Elisha asked for a double portion, Elijah said, it is a hard thing. You have asked for a hard thing. And there are fathers who have made it to be hard. Because they know this is not an easy thing. The thing can kill you if you don't have the stature to carry it. So it's a hard thing. And these are some of the complexities that are there between generations. But I bless the Lord. When I was in Seattle, one of the mothers told me, you guys did not come to preach, but you came to demonstrate fatherhood and sonship. And, and I said, we may not understand it, but he said, the message you left in Seattle was not even what you taught on the pulpit. It was that a father can endorse his son and a son can preach in the presence of the father, which is something we have never had because it looks like the father must either be sick or weak for him to allow the son to preach. Uh, and I know my father is loaded. Even for him to introduce me, I felt it was illegal. But you see, this is the pattern of fatherhood and sonship that I will reconcile the heart of the fathers to the sons. And this is the pattern of revival. So in conclusion, what I will say, let the next generation not be strangers to the previous generation. And let the previous generation also understand every generation has their own dynamic, but let the constants be the constant. I, I, one of the fathers in Kenya called Bishop Gigi, I met him and he asked me, are you still preaching? I said, yes. What are you preaching? The gospel. Which gospel of Jesus? Which Jesus? The one who died, who resurrected, and who is glorified. He said, continue. So let the constant be the constant. Whether we'll come in jeans, whether we'll come in rubbers, but how we come is not the problem. What are we announcing? Because the success of a leader is weighed by the success of their successors. So the constants have to be there. Amazing, 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 amazing. You know, I like what you've said. Um, it's interesting because you can still, it's, it's very difficult to look at somebody you've raised up or see somebody from the time they're small and, and there's this thing that you feel like, Uja, you, if people say, Uja Tosha Mboga, you have not yet, I can't give you this mic. And that's quite a challenge because, you know, you look back and the gentleman, Lawrence, is the one who helped set up these chairs. I started with Lawrence when I was doing some youth ministry. And he, you know, now he, he, he can preach. And, but we want to hold back the mic because you can say, well, I, I knew you when you were a boy. And I think that, 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 that's a great point. And that's number one, something we all need to go back. You need to go back and look at your churches and say, who have I not lifted? Because I've gone too long with them that I've gotten used to them. And so they are, they, we're not fly, fanning the flames of the next generation. And that means there will be no passing forward. And then this generation needs to learn to be fathered because, and you know, th this panel is unique and I, I hope you, you, you listen to that. This, panic, this panel is unique because you're seeing a father and a mother and their spiritual son blessing you. That's a spiritual family. How many people can sit with someone who they have lifted to, you know, I always say, I know who you are by two things. My father is an archbishop uh, and he serves in multiple places around the world. I, al I always say, number one, I look at your associates if, to know if I can trust you. <laughs> if they shine as good as you, I can trust you. Uh, and then number two, you are a step ladder to the next person. 
Therefore, if the next person does not become greater, then I wonder what you are doing. And so, how do you mentor? I was going, I know you're, you're ready to jump, so let me throw this to you too also. How do you mentor somebody to be great, even greater than you, if, if we be forced to say that? Because I, I think the joy is to see the next people going up a ladder higher than you. How do you, how do you nurture and mentor and develop? But I'm going to let you take that. Yeah, I wanted to, thank you so much, Kasper. This is very, very, very powerful. I wanted to give a story, uh, story number one, uh, for adding something to what he has said. How do you, as a pastor and a leader, raise your own children? Because your children are younger than you, you change their diapers and so forth. Because that's how you're going to be mirrored in the main church. And when we began going into evangelism in the early 80s, for me, when I was in high school, when we closed school, I would join our SEAL patron into the mission field across Kenya. And, the, you know, so this is what we observed. That this man of God... Over the holidays, he would pick his own children to the mission field. And this woman of God would be playing guitar and singing when she's very pregnant. And there you can see where the guitar is placed. Of course, at the side. She's saying at the side. Me, I thought it's at the front. <laughs> but the idea was the children needed to come into the atmosphere, into the world of their father. So when the Lord blessed us with two girls, we decided to do the same. When, we, when they closed school and it's holidays, my wife and I would carry our two daughters to the mission field. So when they were of age to introduce themselves, we'd give them the mic, say your name as kids, before thousands of people, say your name. And one of the girls, one day she said, I'm so-and-so and I come from Kenya and we're in Thika because she didn't know the difference between Kenya and Nairobi. But as I talk to you now, she lives in Netherlands, and she says, I come from Kenya. You'll get it tomorrow, uh, if you don't get it now. Listen, one day, we find them, the two girls, in the coach, in our living room, and they are delivering each other and praying for each other, the way they see the father doing it in the meetings. So the two girls, so one stands and the other one touches them here and say, receive your, instead of saying miracle, they would say rimako because they don't they know English. Receive your rimako. Then the kaga would fall. She has received a rimako. Then they would say touch. So one day I found them slaying each other. <laughs> I said, oh my God, I can see. They have seen it. They have caught it. And something has started. And so our daughter, Sheila, would sing with the mother. When she is singing, she will bring the girl and you sing. Today, Sheila is one of the leading worship leaders in the body of Christ in Kenya. And even here in America, where she was with Rodney Howard Brown, she came to the school there of worship. And they said, you can't come on the platform if you are not in the school two years. The first semester, one of the singers heard her sing brought her into the audition, and they broke their rules. First semester, she was placed on the pulpit, the first six voices for Rodney Howard Brown. Because a gift makes room. So what we did, we created the atmosphere, and this is what he said. Where fathers are ministering, their sons should be there. That atmosphere is where they catch the spirit, and later they'll end up doing whatever the next generation has done. So now let's go to your question. I was, just, I was just commenting. You're on commenting. <laughs> okay. I think you, 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 you pulled me so much. I, I was listening instead of moderating. <laughs> now, uh, so. But how do you... So you, you, you have talked about it, and I think I love it, because also you're talking to people who are ministers who are raising their children, and also the current ministers uh, who are young are raising, like I have two small girls, right, who are, who are coming up. And I like what mom said the other day we were in a meeting. She said, the family altar... And she was encouraging the believers who were there. It was to, um, my, my Kikuyu is Nairobian. 
koshuka mwana but anyway she it was to pray, sing for her baby uh, <laughs> that's my interpretation yeah. and so uh, she was encouraging and so i love that idea because many times you can minister to the audience uh, but your home is not ministered to so uh, i love that your children are not going to learn through osmosis there is no passing them and if they are not ready they will not inherit yeah. that mantle so that, that that's a good one so um yeah and yeah, you can go on it was yes. development it was really Develop. development of your yeah, teams yeah one of the things is this in ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 it's a very amazing verse he says for you are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for the works that were originally you know there for you whatever god had purpose for you before so we are his work workmanship hard work created in Christ Jesus what does that mean christ is the anointed one i've observed over the years i've been in ministry when the anointing, the presence of the Holy Spirit begins to move in a church for a season. If, for instance, when Pastor Ruse preaches, preaches here on Sunday and Maura and others, all of a sudden in the service there's a glory of God. The messages are never complete. 15 minutes in the song, glory comes, people begin to fall, to cry. They preach and things are beginning to happen and there's a move of God. That is Christ manifesting in the service in the church so we are created in the anointing christ the messiah if there is no anointing and presence of god god doesn't call people god doesn't raise people but first we need to create an atmosphere of a move of god that's when now we will do a couple of things number one begin to identify those whose testimony story manifestation is is evident we we can identify that young man that young lady when they sing when they pray when they do this so identify then bring them into mentorship there must be specific intentional uh i like the circle small oikos small group small family where they are learning adults learn best in small groups where we can be able to tell them this is what happens so in our church I do these meetings for pastors and other ministers and the young ones every once a month. I have 300 young people we call Young Ministers Forum, the 300 from different churches. And I meet them uh, to speak to them. Uh, a year or so ago, I taught them eight principles of ministry from February to December. Now it's becoming a book on how to have effective you know, ministry and impactful ministry through those eight principles. So identify, number two, train them. Then number three, give them an opportunity to be where there is power at the next level. Let them go with you. I have 12 couples, these are 24 associate ministers. One of their tasks in the church is to track down where I'm preaching. And two of them must be in the meeting. So they organize themselves. The next service, who is going to the apostles meeting? They have to come. Because not only what we are teaching, but they need to be in the meeting and they can see what do you do if demons manifest? What do you do if you're only given 15 minutes and they have sung for two hours? How do you get angry and still release fire? How do you handle time? These are practical things they can learn in the Sunday service. The Sunday services are hacked by religion. They are too short. You can't run ministry with the services. Services, we come here, sing a few songs, and preach a short message, we go home. We need another type of meeting where the ghost is stirring up the other ghosts. So I use the opportunities when we travel around Nairobi, not very far, because they need fare and they need to sacrifice something and so forth. The danger is this. If we're going to raise the next generation, by the way, they are willing. They are ready. They are ready. They are ready any time. The problem is the man of God. One, many of us in the leadership are intimidated by the upcoming and the fire broths that are rising. So we feel intimidated by, they have a huge crowd, they have more miracles or they, they are more famous. So that's why there is need for healing of trauma. 
You need to be healed, brother. Never be intimidated by somebody rising up. In fact, it is to your advantage. Secondly, insecurity is too much. People are very insecure. This is my church. It's not your church. This is my ministry. It's not your ministry. You can be transferred to heaven. And, and let me tell you, let me say this and don't repeat it. Have you ever seen men of God when they go to be with the Lord? In another seven, 14 days, services are continuing as if he is not there. And indeed he is not there. So we need to walk hum with humility to know God is only using us as leaders. Let me mention one more because we can speak forever. One of the greatest challenges I've found that hinders raising the next generation and empowering people is how you handle breakaways in ministry. If you left this church, went and created another church, how did you go? Was it a noisy, messy, loud? Or did you leave quietly, nicely? You even didn't leave. You are sent. If you are never sent, you caused fire and drama where you came from. You sowed. In three years, it will look like you are doing very well and that you are the new arrival man of God. And you're almost having the attitude that where you left, the reverend is asleep. God is now with you more than where you used to be. God will allow you to appear like you are succeeding three years, four years. Then one day, he will come to let you harvest what you sowed. Another one will rise from your midst and he will do you double and you have double pain for what you did. That means even those who are looking down on you, looking up to you for coming up and being mentored and raised will be shocked when you begin to bite the bullet, when you begin to suffer, when you begin to go through processing and so forth. So what I want to say is this. Let's be healed. Let's be mature as leaders, set men, founders, senior pastors, senior ministers. Let's have a big heart like Noah's ark. Do you know Noah's ark? Ask your neighbor, do you know Noah's ark? It received animals and they came two by two, even bad ones. And no animal would eat another. For 40 days, they stayed calm. God extended it to one year. And because Father Noah was in the ark, all the animals, even lions, behaved. When there is true fatherhood in the church, everybody will have their portion, they will rise, and they'll go to the next level. Then let's not allow the fathers to be so old like David in bed, and they have not even handed over, and somebody else decides, I think it's taken too long, let me create a ceremony to take over. And David has to be told, hey, you have to let Solomon take up. So let's do it early, let's identify them early, bring them into training, let's allow them to minister. Uh, one of the things that is radical is this, if I'm away, like now I'm away, the other ministers and sons are the ones preaching Sunday morning and the other meetings and so forth. But they should also pre preach in my presence. Not just when I've traveled. I should take my Bible seat there and I have one of the young men, they are preaching and I'm listening. And when it's a good point, I stand up like I'm being blessed. It will tell others, oh, so he can be blessed by somebody in this church. So when I'm away, he will actually bless them. And they will listen and they will not cause drama. So there are all these. So in summary, how the father behaves is going to determine what environment is being created to raise the next generation. And then for those who are being raised, listen, finally, you will see mistakes and errors and challenges with your father because you are very near. You are very close. You will see them when they are angry. Never attempt to unclothe your father because of what you saw. Shut up. The one who called him or her will handle him or her in your absence. You will not be called into that meeting where he's being asked, where Bure Kabisa would have been. No, no, no. He will be handled at another level. It is not how you are being led that matters. Rather, it is how you are following that matters. Wow.
I think uh, that is why they say old men can see tomorrow while they are sitting, while young men are standing on top of trees and they cannot see right now. Did you just call me a old man? No, 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 no. <laughs> Wise men, sorry. Wise men. <laughs> Oh my goodness, oh my goodness. This is good, is this good? Are you guys getting blessed? You guys, yeah, this is, this is, these are the things we need. Like I said, you are, you are the leaders who are raising tomorrow. Fathers raise fathers. But you have to create fathers. And God has given a lot of people the raw material of fathers. But you have to shape them into fathers. And we are learning how to take the raw material and turn it into fathers. And so this is really good. And this is really good for young ministers because you are learning how you, you gain wisdom through another person's wisdom. It's a greater wisdom. Uh, and lady, if there's any, if there any questions you want to pass forward or you've sent to my, to my phone. Wow, okay, yes. Now this is called innovation. Maybe I, that should be the next question. How do we build innovation? Uh, uh, Pastor Sunda, how, how do we build innovation in leadership? You know, there's so many, so many things. I don't know if this is a good question, but... Um, I was picking my phone to say, take that one, this side. That, that question. Actually, I was going, okay, let yes. me put that question to you. Yes, yes. Hold, hold that question for you, Pastor T. And I can go to the question of dealing with um, conflicts. How do we deal with conflicts uh, among leaders? How do you manage, and, and, and also you can build on that with communication, effective communication in the midst of conflicts. Yeah, um, I think we will answer this one, the two of us. I think in every community there will be conflict, and so there are conflicts in church. I've come to realize that one of the greatest sources of conflict is lack of information. And if there is lack of information, it is not only lack of information, I mean, sometimes there may be communication, but there is no clear understanding of what, um, of, of what is being communicated. And so many times people um, may get into conflict. And the answer to that will be simple, that we need to learn as leaders to have clarity in what we believe in, the vision we have, where we are taking this thing, and also be able to, you know, uh, clearly communicate with great detail and clarity for people to understand. Because, like he said, the Bible says, write the vision in bold letters so that those who see it can be able to follow it. One of the other sources of conflicts in church is um, people who want to come forth, for the lack of a better word, um, people want to, to proceed forth and come forth and become something and enter their ministerial functions, but sometimes the leadership may not be able to, you know, identify them, see them, see that they have a calling, they have an anointing. And again, for me, I think how to handle that, and because of that, many people start fighting and people um, break, even get to the place where they, they break away, like he said. I think that in that kind of a scenario, it is important to know that the people we lead also have a calling. I think Apostle David and all you know, the apostolic teachings that he has taught us, he has, when he started, he started to show us that we have moved from the one-man ministry and gotten into the priesthood of all believers like Martin Luther would teach us in the Reformation. And so we need to realize that we are called to grow people. And, they, and, and if we go that way and we have this um, framework and these um, structures where we are able to grow people, we will minimize conflicts 
in church because we are able to come up, when we are able to come up with an outfit in ministry where everybody finds their place, then everybody will be able to stand at ease and be, you know, in, um, be comfortable in doing what God has called them. And so in a ministry, if I'm in a church, I will want to understand how do I fit in here? What is my place so that I can be able to pursue and follow? And I think that is very important to minimize conflict. I think also, above all things, the word of God is, is very clear. The principle of love, dealing with other people with the love in the church, you know, to me helps be, us be able to handle the different things that come on. I personally think that early in life and early in ministry, I failed a lot because I was a boot camp kind of a pastor's wife. I wanted things to be done in a certain way. And if they don't be done in that way, then I get very uncomfortable. And I also make the people around me very uncomfortable. And so we start conflicting and we start fighting. It has taken some time until I learned to execute grace, to release love, to handle people in the love and in the grace of Christ, and to love people. Um, there is, I think, something that runs cr cross generationally. There is a language of ministry that runs from the smallest to the oldest, and that wineskin, no one can be able to run away from it. It is the wineskin of love. I think, let them add in. Uh, all right. If I add, I would just say conflict is a third stage of your growth relationally in ministry. If you're writing, there are these six C's, the stages by which relationships grow and develop in church and in ministry. We all begin with the first C, which is a contact stage. We've just made a contact. I see who you are. I've heard you. That's it. I don't know anything about you, but we've made some contact exchange the business card numbers and whatever or how do you preach or we had we just spent time together shortly but the second stage after you have contact you can make a choice to go to commitment stage you now do some commitment appointments and say can we meet for coffee can we meet to this service can we go to the service together so you're making a series of meetings and commitments and that's when at that stage you begin to discover oh this one doesn't keep time oh this one talks too much oh this one is a gossiper every time we meet this one is talking about people there's a man we had to stop we say every time you meet this bishop not not bishop sorry for using a, a, a ref i mean it's talking too much about people we say no 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 i think this there's, there's some troubles in the spirit in the past that need to be healed as it were it is a series of commitments that opens up to stage three we call conflict stage and this conflict everybody will have conflict in ministry if you have not had conflicts in your church in your family in the ministry it is coming you need to lift your eyes and check when it is about to arrive and conflict uh, let me tell you a little story number two I was in Israel and they took us to Haifa University and they said as we were 15 people from 15 different nations and we were there, you know, touring Israel. They took us to this uh, university during the lunch. Then they said after lunch, we have 30 minutes lecture. We go to the class. And they got their top sociologists to give us a lecture. And this guy stood before us and he said, Israel is the nation that has more conflict than any other nation in the world. And in essence, he was saying, and we are the guys handling conflict at the university level. We are the top in the world. And this is what he said. Conflicts, he said five myths concerning conflicts. I only mention two. He said, number one, people say conflicts are bad. He said, no, conflicts are not bad. You need a few conflicts to test the waters to know who you are, what is your capacity, what is your ability, who is around you causing more trouble. You are able to identify them. The Bible says, mark those who cause division among you. You need to know them. And you can't know unless they throw some drama. So conflicts are not bad. They just help you discover, oh, we have been visited. Number two, he said, this professor, that 
It's a myth that conflicts can be solved. You say you can't solve them, but you can manage them. In other words, if there is a conflict, have the courage and the confidence to deal with it, talk it over, and find out the truth, clarify this and that, and understand the misunderstanding. And then the conflict, people will mature up. And listen, all those who are feeling pain and are in conflict with somebody else, they say it is good for you because offenses have come. Why? Because God is using somebody else to test your heart. God is interested with your heart. That's why you got an SMS that was abusing you. Don't delete it. Keep the SMS. Every time you look at the SMS, you know Elijah received an SMS from Jezebel. Tomorrow by this time. You remember that SMS? So what often most people want to do is delete it. No, don't delete. Keep it. Until after three days, when you look at it, you don't feel anything. That means you have overcome the spirit behind the SMS. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Listen. Every wrong message that stirs your emotion negatively has a spirit behind it. And we tell people, therefore, in solving conflicts, don't use SMSs in solving problems as pastors and leaders. Meet face to face. Otherwise, if you keep typing, there will be typos and you'll be typing standing in your bedroom and nobody is watching. <laughs> Sit down, brother. So contact, commitment, conflict. When you have a conflict, you have a choice to decide so that you enter in fourth stage we call choices stage. Although we've conflicted this brother, I make a choice to continue. I can handle. I can forgive. I can, you know, we have bigger things to handle other than this little quarreling of a chicken. You know, you know, you make a choice to continue. If you make a choice to continue, you are now ready for stage number five. We call covenant stage. Now we can trust. That's why you hear people say, this is my covenant brother. In other words, when you hear anybody saying, this is my covenant brother, they have fought so much in the past until all the battles are finished. Been there, done that, you Americans will say. And then if you are at that place of covenant and you trust, you are ready for stage number six, we call community. Now you can become a community, a company of people that can minister together and do wonders together, no matter your history and your past and how there are conflicts because you are matured through them. You learned how to forgive, how to say sorry. You learned how to, you know, you know pay back whatever uh, had gone wrong. And now we can trust each other because everybody is under construction and everybody is maturing. Wow. Let's give it up. Let's give it up for those, those key points. I hope some people are taking notes because these are some, and positively, we have it recorded. And so I'm definitely going to go back and look at those. So I think I'm going to give, uh, just in a second, Pastor T to give us a final question because I know I've run out of time. And then, so I can also give the speakers at least to give us a final words each. But I think those are some, uh, going back to Pastor Sunda, we need to clear the air. We need to clear the air. You know, we, we must mature as leaders. And even as we have been told by Apostle, you know, you can, you can go clean up your mess. If you, if you messed, <laughs> if you caused a huge uh, boo-boo or a huge whatever you want to call it, wherever you left, go and clear it up. Mature, humble yourself, carry a gift, and apologize. I, I disrupted the church. I disappeared with half of the people, or I ate the offering, whatever I did. Forgive me. You know, most of the people are just waiting for that. Most fathers are not trying to, they're just waiting for you to just, okay, I'm sorry. And by the way, if it's a good man of God, they'll even bless you. And so, that's a, that's a, that is a place of maturity. And a, pl a place where we'll clear a lot of issues. This walking around without solving problems that you caused causes people to walk on eggshells. How could you ever get to community? How could you ever build trust? 
We can create every institution we want. We can liberate, but if people have not gotten to the place of dealing with the conflicts, I wonder if they can get to community. So that, this is a challenge uh, that you have brought to us because this is true practical leadership. And so thank you so much for those, those uh, words. Now, finally, to uh, Pastor T. Um, when you talk, I'm going, we're gonna focus now on this new generation. How, how do we uh, raise, how do we even discipline? If you talk about church discipline, I'm gonna throw a lot of things. You just flow with how you feel. How do we, how do we raise them in a digital, social media, uh, Gen Y, Z generation? Generation, um, we don't, you know, the new generation doesn't respond the way the older generation responds, you know, and, and so, how do, you, how do you raise, at the same time, discipline and train uh, leaders in a digital age, social media age? That's a very powerful question. Um, how do you raise dig discipline in a dig digital age? I studied the history of jails, and the jails are, have their history from the Roman culture. And jails are considered as elements of punishment and not discipline. So what's the difference? In the Judaist culture, we don't have jails, but we have many laws that were first taught to the people. And once you break the laws, then you are disciplined. So punishment is when there is exertion of force without instruction. And that's where hatred comes in. Discipline is when there is emphasis of the instruction through a different method. Like I said, if you break the glass, uh, you are going to pay it with two glasses. So I've already instructed you. And so you break the glass, you already know what awaits. So we have a generation that has not been instructed, but everyone wants to punish them. We are complaining of what they are doing, but we are not investing to change what they are doing. There is a difference between growing and raising. Growing is a product of exposure to time and space. Any organism will grow when exposed to time and space. Raising is beyond time and space, is investment of values, principles, and disciplines. And that simply means someone must take their time to invest in a generation. The fact that a generation is dynamic. We must understand the time of their birthing. Now, the world has mutated through different cycles of civilization that are known in our age. From what they call the mechanical civilization, we came to the electrical civilization, we came to the computer civilization, now we are in the AI civilization. The mystery of these civilizations always shift the globe 360. And I'm happy that now the church is coming up with the shifts that are coming. In the mechanical and the electrical, uh, we, we, we perpetrated it. Even in the, in, the, in, the, in the computer age, we demonized it. We've always demonized civilization instead of jumping into them and using them for the advancement of the kingdom. Because civilization will automatically provoke change instantly. And you can never fight change unless you're applying what you call the ostrich principle. You bury your head in the sand and assume nothing is happening outside your environment. But anyone that is alive, breathing, is aware that change is happening daily. So there are two methodologies that can be adopted. Number one, we need to engage the generation that is in that level of change so that they are the ones packaging and you know, aligning us to be able to be effective and still pass the message. Um, uh, 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 like today, someone asked me for an advertisement. And I told the person, I don't know how I'm gonna do this, but I'm going to do the video. And then I just passed it over. The one who manages my social media is a Gen Z. I've never subscribed to TikTok, but I have more than a million followers on TikTok. He's the one who opened the page. He's the one who understands what runs, what sells on TikTok. And that's when I discovered I'm growing old. 
uh, and he told me, Pastor, you have such an opportunity. Grew my YouTube page from 15,000 to more than 100,000. So this generation understands the dynamic of social media. Now, in the age of AI, we are getting into a very complicated stage of the robotics. And it is here with us. You know, you, you might criticize it, but if you use the Google map, you're already in that age. Because that's a robotic software trying to give you navigation. So the church, the, 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 there are three things that makes the church uh, to be of, uh, you know, to be of impact in a society. The church has to be relevant. That's very important. The church has to understand the dynamics of the day. Uh, that is influence for the church to have impact. Relevance and influence is very key. I discovered the devil is not afraid when 20 pastors gather in a nation that has 520 million citizens and they gather and discuss deep truths. The devil will even sponsor that meeting. But the devil is afraid when 20 pastors gather but they are all live on their social media platforms and they are now influencing 20,000 people with these ideologies. There has always been that humble word from the people, we were not called to be popular. But popularity is a currency of impact. So if you don't want to be popular, then you are telling the Lord, I don't want to be impactful. One of the things that made the ministry of Jesus to have impact was popularity. That he will show up in the city and everyone will come. How did they come? They knew him. The Bible says a news about him. Meaning that he was popular. It's only that our popularity is not the celebrity kind of popularity. Our popularity is tied to a product we have died into and that product is Jesus. So that's why we need now to mold greatness and not celebrityness. So innovation must be there for us to be relevant, for us to be impactful. Last, before I left Kenya, I graduated more than 200 people who had undergone through discipleship class online. And they had the time, they joined, right now we are doing, uh, someone just joined the discipleship class from Switzerland, who is, who is a Muslim who got born again and he wants to know about Christianity. I was denied visa to go to Switzerland, but oh my, I'm discipling someone there because technology has broken the barriers. We are designing a software because we discover that we do a lot of high school evangelism, but the gap is now discipleship. And we are discipling, we are designing a software where when a young person gets born again, they can go online, run through the discipleship program, and that website will give them a certificate to show that they have gone through discipleship that you cannot go through lecture two if you've not completed lecture one and there are questions generated by the ai website that you have to answer and pass them for you to, the, to go to the next stage guess who's doing it is a third year student in kenyatta university who is a tech guru now i don't need to gather i just need to record one session of discipleship which will affect generation that even when I'm in America, someone is going through discipleship, either in China, either in the West and all that. And we are taking advantage of AI. I don't know if you understand that virtual reality is taking over. And as we have live, a time is coming where someone will be choosing to listen to worship from Nehemiah Gospel Church and listen to preaching from Life Church through virtual reality. They just attend in their homes. I don't know what we are doing to take that space. Because the space is already there. They will even have the virtual church. The same way we demonize Facebook. And all of us are on Facebook and our cameras are upside down. In the same way we need to ask ourselves as a church, what are we doing? And I believe when I was doing the strategic plan for the church, someone asked me, and this is the question I'll ask everybody. Who will you be pastoring 10 years from now? And that generation, what are they consuming now? And even to make it uh, just even technical, I realized that Donald Trump has jumped into power. And I realized it was only the other day when the man left power. And my question has been, in the next five years of his rulership, who will be the members in my church? 
what am I doing now to make sure that I'm relevant then? Because they can outgrow me because I'm not growing with the changing dynamics. The church has to be creative and innovative. My father is on TikTok, but I want to believe he has never gone live on TikTok. Meaning that he's using the skills of a generation to push the content in their space. Young people are not a liability. They are an asset. And they come with all these creativities and that adds value. These lights add no anointing. All this decor does not add any anointing. But this creativity is an added advantage to production. Because churches have moved from ordinary services. They've entered into productions. And so such elements are very key to improve the quality of your production. So that when you go online, you have many productions, but there is excellence that makes you follow in that production. And these dynamics are within the young people. We, this is where they come in because there's a lot of value that they add. Innovation should not end. For the first sign of death in a church is not just the lifting of the Holy Spirit. Is when religion enters and there is no innovation anymore. We enter into a plateau. And guess how you pursue that thing of innovation? Let the people sitting in your boardroom, let 80% represent the people you are preaching in the church. The greatest error has always been 30 years, 40 years, 50 years planning a youth conference for 18 years and below and they think this is what they want and then we come up with a product that is not palatable and for us we are doing it in our day but remember this is not their day. And by the time we present it, we are waiting God to move like he moved in the 70s. Bring the young people on board. Let them say what they are thinking. So those small innovations will make them own. And then after that, let the standard be the standard. They are non-negotiables that will perpetually be there. Right now, there is a meeting happening this weekend called Gen Z's Love Jesus in Kenya. And it was bugged out of Mandamano. And he's a friend of mine doing it. And what they have done, they asked the young people, what, where do you want to go? They said, Uhuru Park is for the old guys. They're now going to a place in Karen called Waterfront. It's a play park full of fun. And they want music. They want spray painting. And then they want to be baptized with the Holy Ghost with colors all over their faces. Now, you can't try that in Uhuru Park. Uhuru Park is you come with your Bible and your notebook and fire. But here is a generation that is young. You can't deny them being young. But he's still hungry for God. So they want to go and spray paint each other. And then after that lift up their hands and receive the Holy Spirit. We may not understand them. But even the young man running the campaign. If you look at his dress code, you will not know he's an apostle. But he knows this innovation. And I told them, our crusades may not look like the ones that were done in our days. Bills Moiro used to match his garments with the stage. That was his creativity. And the man who made it was an Indian. Now, our generation may not thrive in those crusades. We are now doing street bash. We are doing praise pop-ups in the streets. We are doing waterfront events. People are swimming, but they are hearing the gospel. Those dynamics may be strange for another generation, but that creativity is what is winning them. Guess what they said? On that day, they will baptize more than 300 young people. They are having um, an open pool. And not only will they baptize, even those who will get born again, there will be baptism at the site. Who are baptizing them? The Gen Zs. What is that? Innovation and creativity and still preaching the gospel. So let's keep on thinking. Amazing. I hope those were challenges. You know, my father used to say, sometimes the greatest threat to the next move is the last move. Because they, they can understand, why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? And I think, you know, I, I love that. We need to mature and grow. And I love what you said, you know, as you were talking. Uh, Mr. Frank, can you stand up? Mr. Billy Frank, Pastor Billy Frank. You see this gentleman right here? He's part of the creative genius. 
You know, when you look at this, you know, he, when you look at the production, the lights, the, you know, these things may, may seem like, but there's excellence. You know, even God, when he made the temple, God didn't just say, just go do this way. He gave in specific instructions to Moses uh, uh, on the tabernacle, but on the, sorry, to David when he comes to the temple. But even the tabernacle was beautiful. It, it was, but the tabernacle is different than the temple. So every generation is given a specific set of skills. And if we are refusing, if, if, if even me, I'm not going to lie, there are things that I'm learning from my Gen Ys and Zs. You know, like, if I do some things, they're like, I, you know, you, you, are, you, are, you, are, you need to upgrade, right? So you come to see that we can learn if we humble ourselves. And just like you said, you know, I, um, I do a, a little bit of YouTube. And the interesting thing is, until uh, I got to a place where I allowed other people to manage and to market and deal with things, I was like everybody else. You know, you see churches make a song of telling Billy, you put it online and then you cross your fingers and say, you only get like 100 views. You spent like $2,000 to make a music video or a production for your church for 100 views. While you look at somebody who has realized it's a Gen Y and Z, and that song you made is powerful, it has the anointing, it's not, just, it's not packaged properly. And, and then you see like Pastor T going and when he shows up, Y'all all know, when he shows up, people are watching. He's been packaged for the generation, for the time. If you do want to get that anointing of the time, you have to humble yourself and say, how am I presenting myself? And this is where now you get people who are more uh, proficient to help your efficiency. Amen? I hope you've been blessed. And I hope you've been challenged. Because I've been blessed and challenged. Amen? And so, um, our time is done. I wish I could have this conversation. It's been a beautiful conversation. Uh, so, I'm going to start with Pastor T uh, for you to give us uh, your final uh, remark. Um, you know, most of us have watched you for decades and we just want to get your view on leadership and, and, and generational leadership. So, speaking from your heart, uh, to encourage those who have gone before, but also to uplift those who are coming up. My view on leadership and generational leadership is that the church must adopt the apostolic concept. The doctrine of fatherhood and sonship is graced enough to be taught from the apostolic dimension. Uh, we have produced more servants and less sons. And that's why the continuity of a generation and the leadership and the patterns must be apostolical in nature. I believe that was the first template that was portrayed by the first apostolic church. It was a Paul raising a Timothy and, you know, entrusting him with the mysteries and the truth and raising a son that is able to really pioneer this. There are many wisdoms that have been borrowed from secular leadership but we need to understand the entity we are leading is very parallel from Babylonian system, Egyptian system, Greek system, Roman system. It is a kingdom system. And we can never apply the formula of the world and expect the results of the kingdom. The reason why we are slowly seeing some patterns failing expression is because there is a general neglection of the very patterns that the Lord laid on board for this uh, particular continuity. Apostolically, we understand that grace is in human vessels. The Lord has chosen a human to put the grace. So you have the option either to concentrate on the vessel or on the grace. Men don't pursue men only. It's only that the grace cannot be carried in absentia. There has to be a vessel. The language of our graces is not respect, is not obedience only. The language of graces is honor. Respect is unto instructions. Obedience is a language of rank. But honor is a language of grace. Honor is when I know what Apostle Juma carries is from God. What he carries is for my benefit. And what he carries is 
not something that can benefit him. So when I look at him from a level of grace and honor is beyond carrying a bag, I can carry his bag, but I've never carried his heart. Honor is when I saw my life under that grace. And I've realized that the best way to teach fatherhood, the best way to teach fatherhood is becoming a son to a father. And the best way to teach sonship is when you demonstrate sonship to another father. I've never taught the topic of sonship, but I've always worked with my father. And I've discovered what I have invested as I serve him is what the sons in the house have reciprocated while serving me. And I'll conclude with this. Fatherhood and sonship is not structured. It is a heart-to-heart -heart relationship. There is no one day you've ever sent a request saying, I want to be a friend. It is through the walk that their hearts are knit together. And I believe that is what they call the new wineskin for the leadership that the church needs. And once we adopt that, we will have generational ministries that will never die. Maybe that is why the Asian Catholic Church adopted the name Father. And you can see, you never hear of a splitter Catholic. Maybe, just maybe. Wow, amazing, 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 amazing. Adopting the apostolic pattern. I believe by the grace of God, in the end time church, it's church unusual. We have entered the age of apostolic and prophetic hubs of grace. And if you, we don't learn that, we will be ineffective for the next generation and for the time that we've been given. Amazing. Now, mom, if you can give us your word. And I think that um, for all that Pastor T is saying to happen for fathers and sons to, you know, find expression, we got to go back to the foundations again of the church as a family. Our spiritual father, my husband and I, I is called Apostle John Ali, he says that there is no Christianity without relationships. That relationships are key when it comes to expression of the Christian, New Testament Christian faith and practice. And so we need to go back to the place where relationships are fostered, are developed. We need to adopt an attitude. We need to adopt a grace, the heart for developing relationships. That means that we got to destroy the, the, the structures, the hierarchical structures and mindsets. And we got to come down to a place where we simply become family. There, the fathers are in their place and their place cannot be wished away. They are indeed encouraged to stand as fathers because they are so important to that family for it to function. I'm talking about the church. They are the mothers are no longer seen as unnecessary baggage and uh, troublesome pastor's wives and bishop's wives. No, they are standing in their place because everybody understands that without our presence there, I, there is a place I cannot go. They are the brothers and the sisters are in place and the place has become one beautiful expression of the love of God and the grace of God. The church is the family. May we um, embrace the grace and the understanding of the spiritual family. I want to close with what I, I, I sense is a prophetic call to the diaspora church right here. Jude uh, is only one chapter, one verse. I'm going to read verse 3. Jude <clears throat> 1 uh, is one chapter. So verse 3 says, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation. Somebody say our common salvation. I found it necessary to write to you uh, exhorting you to do what? To contend earnestly Look, for the faith which was once and for all 
delivered to the saints. The diaspora has been invaded by strange gospel and strange practices. And the Holy Spirit has been urging us to release the warning and exhortation and let you pastors and leaders and brethren to ensure that I'm so excited when I hear about the meeting at the waterfront, but they are going to baptize. What is to baptize? Is the leader to declare, I submit to Jesus, I have received his salvation, and I'm not ashamed to identify myself as a son of God. We must contend for the faith that was once and for all delivered to us. I want to ask you as a leader, what is your greatest assignment on the earth as a leader? Is to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you lose the gospel, the message, because in every generation, they have to be instructed, they have to be given the values, they have to be given the instruction, they have to be given the word, that is gospel. We must not lose the gospel that was once and for all delivered to us by those who went before us. And so I urge you to go put your face back in the Bible, in the word, on your knees before the presence of God and let the Lord ignite again the first love, the anointing, so that you can come out of your prayer closet and intimacy with a message that can never be stopped by nothing. So that even if your message is being circulated through AI and the new innovation, it is still has the original fire. And your leadership will outlive you and the next generation will pick something from you. Because ministry, brothers, is not just professional. Ministry is spiritual. May the Lord bless you. Amen, 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 amen. Wow, you know, from what I've learned today, I will say this, relationship, not usership. A lot of times our, our churches of ministries, we, they've become institutional. And that's why you see a pastor fall or do something wrong and they kick him out and get lawyers from outside. A worship leader messes up. The church goes and gets an outside lawyer to come and tell him to sign a non-disclosure agreement. We've become institutionalized. And where there is just institution without relationship, you cannot have father-son relationships. And this is why some people get worried when people cross a certain age and they leave our churches and sometimes go to other American churches, if I can say majority and non uh, sub Saharan majority churches. And so, this um, anointing, and the other thing is, we need to see anointing. People, the next generation wants to see the authentic move of God. And, like you said, they grow by watching and participating. When your father in faith is moving in power, when your father in you are observing, you're growing through watching and walking in their steps, there's no greater training than that in terms of the next leadership. And so that also challenges the ministers. When I'm standing, I, how do I see my space? Am, am I flowing in the anointing? And if that's not happening, I need to get, I need to ask for help sometimes. I need to get back to the closet with the Holy Spirit, the anointer, because the anointer is who the next generation are looking for. I've heard about it. I want to see it. I want to experience it. And so I want to thank our panel. Let's give it up to our panel. They have just given us a full course menu in leadership. And I also want to thank our organizers, Pastor Bitok and your entire team. May you be blessed for putting this together. And even I humbled myself uh, for, uh, for you guys to ask me to come and do this. Uh, you had many ministers you could have called, and so I'm humbled at, at that request. And so with that, uh, we are done with this session. I'll call Pastor B. Talk. And finally, let's give it up one more time 
for our dynamic panel and how much you have given us. Praise the Lord. An amazing job. Thank you, Pastor. That was amazing. Bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Wow. Were you blessed? Amen. Welcome to Actualize Talks, your destination for purpose discovery, setting vision goals, and fostering leadership growth. I'm joined in studio by Dr. Kasper. Dr. Kasper. Joining me now in the studio, we have Dr. Kasper.